Hi guys, my name is Alexander. I have a terrible case for you. So listen up. Being a teacher is one of the most difficult jobs in the entire world. It's not only the responsibility of inspiring and developing young minds, or even the lack of funding, that makes teaching one of the most stressful careers. It is the lack of safety measures in place to protect teachers from the very students they teach. Colleen Ritzer was a 24-year-old math teacher at Danvers High School in Danvers, MA. After spending the afternoon of October 22, 2013, helping several students requiring assistance with their algebra, she would be seen on school surveillance video being followed to the bathroom by 14-year-old Philip Chisholm. He had his hood up in an attempt to hide his identity, gloves on his hands and a box cutter in his pocket. What he would do to Colleen in the girls' bathroom of that high school has been described as one of the most disturbing murders committed by a young teenager. Then, Philip simply disposed of her body in the schoolyard and went to see a movie. Even more shocking was the excuse given by Philip when asked by the police why he did something so heinous. He claimed he was struggling with his parents' divorce and had difficulty making friends at his new school. However, the police weren't buying his story. They alleged that even as a young teen, Philip Chisholm was evil enough to plan out the vicious rape and murder of a woman who had done nothing other than help and support him at school. Philip Chisholm wasn't crazy when he killed Colleen Ritzer, the lead prosecutor in his murder trial told jurors Monday. He was focused and unwavering from his horrible plan to take what he wanted. He had a goal, Essex County Assistant District Attorney Kate McDougall said. A terrible, terrible purpose. And he played it out in the woods, and he didn't care what came after that. Ritzer, who was 24 and in her second year teaching at Danvers High School when she died, was found outside the school nearly naked, legs propped up and spread, a tree branch inside her. The slash wounds on her neck were so deep her vertebra was chipped. Colleen Ritzer knew from an early age that she wanted to grow up to be a teacher and change people's lives. Born to her parents, Thomas and Peggy Ritzer, on May 13, 1989, in Lawrence, M.A., she was a wonderful big sister to her little sister, Laura, and above all else, loved spending time with her family and making memories. She was the kind of young lady who made an impression on everyone she met. When she wasn't watching her sister's hockey games, she enjoyed shopping, traveling, and creating photo collages, but nothing topped her desire to teach. Yes, it would be her career, but it was also her biggest passion in life. After graduating from Andover High School in 2007, she pursued a teaching degree from Assumption College. Her first year of teaching was spent at Hale Middle School before she moved to Danvers High School, where she taught math. Not an easy gig, but she enjoyed every minute of it. Colleen's biggest goal was to find unique and creative ways to teach her students, which is evident from tweets on her old Twitter account, which is still publicly available online. Her bio reads, Math teacher often too excited about the topics I'm teaching. And her feed is filled with math equations, sports cheers, and student reminders. She was very much loved by the students she taught. One of Colleen's former students, Christian Snyder, would say that math was his least favorite subject until he had Ms. Ritzer as his teacher. He told the media, It was always a struggle, but she was always positive and happy and she made me feel like I wanted to go to math class. Source, TwinCities.com In 2013, Colleen had been teaching ninth grade algebra at Danvers High School for the last two years. She loved teaching there and was really active in the school community of approximately 1,000 students. On October 22, 2013, Colleen was to be teaching her classes like any other day. Because it was the week before Halloween, the school halls were bustling with spooky decorations. But no one had any idea of the real leaf horrifying events that were going to take place at school that day. Colleen went to school, taught her classes, and planned to stay longer so that she could help a few students with their math homework. This was something that she often did. She spent much of her spare time helping students who were struggling to complete their work. However, later that evening, long after the doors had been closed to students for the day, Colleen failed to return home from work. The 24-year-old math teacher still lived at home with her parents, and when didn't come home that evening and wasn't answering her phone, they started to worry.
Colleen's father, Tom, decided to drive to the school to see if she was still there. He found her vehicle parked in the lot, but no sign of Colleen. He asked a few straggling staff members if they had seen Colleen, but no one remembered seeing her after the school day finished. Tom returned home to start calling all of his daughter's friends, but none knew where Colleen was. When he called the police to report Colleen as missing, he discovered that she was not the only one. Just a few hours prior, a ninth grade Danvers High School student by the name of Philip Chisholm was reported missing by his mother. Philip was 14 years old at the time and new to the area. He had recently moved from Tennessee to Massachusetts with his mother after his parents divorced. He had only begun attending Danvers High School a few months ago and had really been struggling to make new friends. That day, Philip went to his regularly scheduled classes and was supposed to attend soccer practice, but he never showed up. His mother was worried that he might have run away. It was highly unusual that both a student and teacher would go missing on the same day, so the police had to figure out what the connection was. They focused on the whereabouts of Philip Chisholm and were able to ping his cell phone. They learned that his last known whereabouts were in the vicinity of a local movie theater called Hollywood Hits Theater. In speaking with the staff, they learned that the teenager had purchased a movie ticket and left once the film was over. There was a search effort launched to try to locate where the missing boy was now. Meanwhile, investigators back at the high school pulled the footage from the school's surveillance system from that day. What they saw in the video was highly alarming. At approximately 2.54 p.m. on the day she went missing, Colleen was seen exiting a classroom and walking towards the women's washroom. Seconds later, Philip Chisholm is seen stepping out of the same classroom and then stepping back in. A moment later, Philip walks out of the classroom again. However, this time he has a hood over his head and gloves on his hands. On another camera, Colleen is seen entering the women's washroom, and seconds later, Philip walks into the washroom behind her. Approximately 10 minutes later, another female student is observed walking into the same washroom, but she quickly exits. Later, this student would say she stepped into the girl's bathroom to make a phone call to her father, but instead, she saw a naked butt. She assumed she had walked in on someone changing and quickly ran out. Shortly after she leaves, Philip is seen walking out of the washroom with the hood still over his head. He exits the school, heading towards the parking lot, and when he re-enters, he has on a new change of clothing. He grabs his sweater, a gray backpack, a black bag, and a purple bag from the classroom, and then at around 3.14 p.m., he is seen on video wheeling a large black recycling bin towards the elevator and up to the second floor into the women's washroom. He exits the washroom with the large bin and wheels it outside of the school, leading towards the wood line. He returns to school about 25 minutes later in a new change of clothing before heading out to the movies. The police had to see what was in that women's washroom. When they looked inside, they found smears of blood on the floors and walls. Whatever had happened inside that bathroom was violent just after midnight, Philip would be found walking by himself down the highway in a nearby town called Topsfield, located about 10 minutes away. He had a knife in his pocket and a treasure trove of evidence in his backpack, including a bloody box cutter, women's underwear and several bank cards and a driver's license belonging to Colleen Ritzer. When the police officer who located him asked him where the blood on the box cutter came from, he responded, That girl. Initially, Philip tried to say that he had broken into Colleen's car and stolen the items, but his story began to fall apart back at the station. Meanwhile, investigators were making a horrific discovery back at the school. In a wooded area adjacent to the high school, police would find the body of Colleen Ritzer, naked from the waist down. The body had been covered in brush and leaves in an attempt to hide it. She had been stabbed, with her throat slit, and a note was found nearby that read, I hate you all. About 20 years away, police found the large black recycling bin that had been used to transport her body from the women's washroom to where she was found. Colleen's autopsy would reveal that her killer had strangled her, stabbed her 16 times, and then sexually assaulted her. Once she was carried out to the woods, she was assaulted again with a tree branch. It's believed that Colleen may have been alive while in the wooded area, 
though there were two causes of death listed on her death certification, both asphyxiation and loss of blood. There was too much damage to determine which would have killed her first. Either way, it is one of the most horrific ways to die. In speaking with another student who was in the classroom with both Colleen Rietzer and Philip Chisholm earlier on the day of the murder, they learned that a specific discussion may have sparked Philip's outrage. This student alleged that when Colleen had mentioned the state of Tennessee, Philip became visibly angry. His whole demeanor changed, and he became extremely upset. This may have had something to do with the fact that Philip had recently moved from Tennessee, and he was not adjusting well. He didn't want his parents to get divorced, and he recently didn't want to move to a new state at the beginning of high school. He was angry about having to start over, and he hated his new school because he alleged he was bullied. This would become the basis for Philip's entire defense. Over nearly 90 minutes Monday, just like they had in 13 days of testimony, jurors heard the competing views of who Chisholm was on Oct. 22, 2013, the day he killed, raped, and robbed his math teacher. Was he a boy in the throes of psychosis who couldn't help but listen to the commanding voice in his head? Or is he a malicious, destructive teenager who is faking a mental illness only after getting caught. At stake is whether Chisholm, now 16, spends decades in a state mental hospital or an adult prison. Eight men and four women deliberated for more than three hours Monday afternoon before going home for the night. They will return Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Chisholm, in a suit and slightly crooked tie, watched it all. Both the attorney trying to save him and the one who says he's a liar he watched himself on screen the day of the murder, as McDougall attributed his every movement to his ultimate goal. His defense attorneys say he was psychotic. Why else would a kind, smart, good-natured 14-year-old commit these terrible acts? His attorney, Denise Regan, asked. In a soft voice apologizing for consulting her notes, Regan painted a picture of a boy untethered, uprooted from his home in Tennessee, thrust into a school and town where he knew no one and had no place to hide. What other than an overpowering mental illness could cause Philip Chisholm to do these acts? Regan asked. She pointed to the defense's expert witness, Dr. Richard Dudley, who has spent decades evaluating kids and teens with severe mental illnesses. He believes Chisholm heard voices since he was 10. Another psychiatrist treating Chisholm this fall apparently agreed, Regan said diagnosing him as psychotic and depressed, and prescribing him an antipsychotic medication. When Philip Chisholm followed Ms. Ritzer into that bathroom, he was not himself, Reagan said. He was not a kind, smart, 14-year-old boy. He was responding to the terrible command hallucinations in his head. He didn't choose to do this. Jurors again saw those chilling videos of Chisholm following Ritzer into the girl's bathroom. McDougal, nearly yelling at times, yet her voice still wavering with emotion, walked them through Chisholm's movements, checking his pocket for the box cutter, putting his hoodie on, donning gloves, opening the bathroom door. But all those images, while they show deliberate premeditation, she said, don't matter as much as one. The only still image that matters in this case is the image of Colleen in the woods, McDougall said. The image that the defendant painted of Colleen, stripped, battered, brutalized, and violated. Chisholm's backpack and school ID was placed nearby, not a sign of irrationality, like his lawyer said, but instead, McDougall argued, a terrible signature to his crime. For the first time, McDougall suggested that Ritzer didn't die in the second floor girl's bathroom, but in the woods where her body was found. Why else, McDougall asked, was Chisholm so intent that afternoon on getting a friend away from the girl's bathroom where he'd just attacked Ritzer, because he thought she might cry, or crawl it out, she said. He doesn't think he's killed her yet, McDougall said, and I suggest to you he hadn't. Ritzer was incapacitated but not dead when she got to the woods, McDougall said. That's where he carved those deep wounds, she said and finished his sexual assault. We know Philip Chisholm didn't get to finish what he started in the bathroom because he was interrupted, she said. Finishing what he started and taking what he wanted 
seemed to be a theme of McDougal's closing. When he shoplifted a knife from a BJ's wholesale club hours after the attack, carefully avoiding the store workers, it was just another example of Philip Chisholm doing and getting what Philip Chisholm wants, McDougal said. McDougal didn't spend much time refuting the defense expert's testimony, nearly all of which, she said, relied on Chisholm's own accounts. She noted that jurors won't have the same luxury. We hope that the world is predictable, McDougall said, that there's an explanation for why something terrible happens. There is not one single person in this courtroom who wants to believe that a 14-year-old boy could have done this and not been crazy, McDougall said. But doing something so awful does not make you crazy. He would be charged with first-degree murder, robbery, and aggravated rape. He would also be tried as an adult. While awaiting trial, he got himself into even more trouble by attacking a female guard. Philip followed her into a staff locker room, carrying a pencil in his hand. He came up behind her and began choking her, and as she began to scream, he began punching her. Thankfully, other guards heard her screaming and ran in to save her because there was a clear pattern here and he likely would have tried to kill her. In Colleen's murder, he pleaded not guilty. Philip's defense lawyer argued that he suffered a psychotic break, possibly stemming from that conversation about Tennessee and the trauma he had after his parents' divorce. He alleged that he dramatically changed from a happy-go-lucky kid to a depressed teenager when he was forced to move across the country and start over. The prosecution disagreed. The proof was really in those videos. They alleged that Philip Chisholm planned the murder ahead of time. He got up that day for school and brought a box cutter and gloves with him, along with a change of clothes. Besides the divorce, there wasn't really anything in his background to predict that something like this could happen. He didn't show the typical signs of troubled youth, yet there they were. Ultimately, Philip would be found guilty. He was criminally responsible for the murder of Colleen Ritzer, for the murder charge, he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years, the highest level the law allows. However, for the rape and robbery charges, he received two 40-year terms to run concurrently, meaning he'll likely never be getting out of prison alive. In 2016, Colleen's family sued the town of Danvers, Danvers Public Schools, the school's cleaning company, and the company that designed the school's security system for their role in her murder. The lawsuit would be settled in 2022, with Colleen's parents alleging that they failed their daughter. According to the suit, the school's security system was inefficient. Also, the cleaning company hired by the school did not call the police when they discovered blood in the women's washroom. They simply cleaned it up. The killer may be in prison, and the civil suits may be settled, but it still does not bring back Colleen.